Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Behind the Scenes Live. Now, if you've never joined us before, why? <laughs> How day? Now, this is our third Behind the Scenes Live, and it's great to have you all here. Behind the Scenes Live, what is it? Well, it's our little sneak behind the scenes at Royal Museums Greenwich. Now, the next question is, what is Royal Museums Greenwich? Well, Royal Museums Greenwich is made up of four fantastic venues. We have the Queen's House, the Cutty Sark, National Maritime Museum, and the Royal Observatory. Now, together they make Royal Museums Greenwich. And in that collection of venues, there's 2.5 million objects. Now, they can't always go on display. Um, we can't fit them all in. <laughs> but these objects need to go somewhere when they're not on display or when they need a rest, just like us. We need a somewhere to, to be to relax and to be cared for. And the special place where they come for, for their treatments and to be looked after, is the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre. And that is where we are today. Now, if you've joined us before, you would have seen us in different stores. Today's really exciting because we're actually in one of our studios. We are in the paper studios. And I have got my colleagues and my friends who are say, here they are, lovely. And um, can start off with you. So I've got Manuel. So Emmanuel, welcome. Um, Thank you. What do you what do you do here, um, and where are we? So we are today in the paper conservation studio at the Prince Philip um, Maritime Collection Centre. Um, so in the paper studio, so we are looking after the paper collection in the Maritime Museum. Um, the paper collection consists of a wide range of objects, some that we are expecting, and maybe some that we are expecting a bit less. So we have. Um, archive collection, we have the library, we have prints and drawings, we also have photographic collection, we have ship plans, we have globes that we'll be talking about later. We also look after objects that are not on paper, but on vellum. We also look after some glass plate objects that are part of the photographic collection, and some objects on ivory, like the miniature we have also at PPMCC. So you've got a team you manage here, yeah. and you look at many different aspects of paper, and I'm going to introduce one of our global superstars. There you go, that's your first <laughs> cheesy joke for the night. And um, so, a global superstar, Paul. Um, what do you focus on, um, and what you've worked with us for many years at the um, at Royal Museum Greenwich, but what, what area do you focus in in regards to paper? Well, yes, I'm a conservator emeritus here. Formerly, I worked in the paper section, uh, and uh, uh, for a lot of my time, I worked quite closely with the Globe collection, particularly, and uh, with uh, the other paper collections. So, this is our little message to you. Stay tuned. Do not leave it, because Paul is going to be telling us all about our Globe collection. And my big question is, what's inside a Globe? Which I can't wait to see. So, come back. We're definitely going to have a look at that. But we're going to go to a video. Um, one of our colleagues over in the paper studio has made a brilliant video for you to find out because um, it's not always about looking after the actual paper by touching it um, that way there's also we need to house it we need to care for it and Helen has made a brilliant video all about mounting so I hope you enjoy that but in the meantime the one thing I want to tell you is if you've got any questions for our specialists tonight Please, please, please get in touch with us on Facebook, on YouTube, and we'll try our best to answer those questions. So, tonight's all about paper. Have you got any questions about paper? Get in touch. But let's go to this amazing video featuring Helen. Hi, I'm Helen Sayer, and I'm the Paper Conservation Technician at Royal Museums Greenwich. Here in the paper studio, we have a wide variety of objects to look after. I'm Helen Sayer and I'm the Paper Conservation Technician at Royal Museums Greenwich. Here in the paper studio we have a wide variety of objects to look after, ranging from paintings, charts, manuscripts and maps, to photographs, globes, glass negatives and volumes. In my role I mount and frame objects due to go on display and I also look after the collection by creating bespoke housing solutions out of archival materials 
when the objects need to go to store. So why do we mount objects? Well, aside from being a great way to present them for display in the gallery, there are several benefits to mounting objects and artworks beyond aesthetic reasons. In terms of storage, mounting is a great way to keep items safe, as the mount board acts as a protection layer above and below the object. Because the object is attached inside the mount, the risk of damage is greatly reduced, and it also allows for easier and safer handling. With the addition of a frame that has been sealed up at the back, the object is protected from dust, air pollutants and airflow. Deciding on the most appropriate mounting methods really is done on a case-by-case -case basis and considerations are made on the type of artwork, the condition of the object, the media used and also any um, display preferences that might need to be met. So first I'm going to show um, one we have here, a 19th century print, which is hand coloured and this has been mounted with T-hinges. You can see here there are vertical and horizontal strips of Japanese paper which have been applied, one as a crossbar over the top, and a tiny amount of wheat starch paste has been used on the back of the print, and this is a reversible adhesive. So this is going to be uh, displayed temporarily, and then it'll come out of, of the mount, and um, The benefit of T-hinging is that it can be lifted up to access the back. So here we have a painting, an oil sketch by John Everett, and this is from the early 20th century. Um, this has been on display and has now been kept in its mount for storage purposes. We've used a slot inlaying method uh, to mount this one. This consists of Japanese paper strips being cut and adhered evenly all the way around the outside on the underside of the um, painting. And these are fed through slots that are cut into a sheet of inlay paper. Paper. And because the tabs are actually hidden, it gives the illusion that the object is floating, which works well for this piece because the paint goes all the way to the edge and we want to display the full object. The benefit of having it inlaid is that as well as having it mounted for storage, the inlay paper makes handling a lot more safe and easy. So here we have a letter that was written in 1803 that I've just mounted in the studio for display. The writing has been done in iron gall ink, which is moisture sensitive. And given that the writing goes really close to the edge of the paper on the back, um, a non-adhesive method uh, has been used for the mounting process, uh, as opposed to an adhesive method involving wheat starch paste. I use Japanese paper cut into large strips to fold around each corner of the letter. Slots were cut directly into the mount board following the line of the object's edge and the paper tails fed through and adhered to the back of the mount board with wheat starch paste. The weight of the object is supported by these wide paper tabs. The fishing line, positioned away from the edges of the letter, has been strung vertically to follow the crease lines on the letter and serves to lightly hold the object against the mount. Here the window mount has been cut larger than the object so that all the edges are visible. Thank you for that, Helen. What amazing video seeing what goes on behind the scenes. And that's what this is all about. Showing you how we look after your collection because at the end of the day, it's yours. You know, we these treasures belong to you and we do our best to we're just custodians and that's why we make this show because we want you guys to see all the processes and all the hard work it takes to look after these so we can keep telling the amazing stories about these fantastic objects. Now, just a little reminder, this is interactive tonight. If you want to get in touch with us, please feel free to pop a message in the chat boxes on YouTube or on Facebook and we'll try our best to answer any questions but I've also got a question for you tonight actually because we love hearing from you what's your favorite paper-based item do you have anything at home which you find really special you know it could be an old birthday day a birthday card it could be a drawing by a famous artist or oh, 
could be even a globe. <laughs> no? Oh, well. So, talking about globes, I have got Paul with us. Um, this is really exciting. Um, I, I just... Paul, we've been doing tours um, for a few years now at the Prince Philip Maritime Collection Centre, and the biggest uh, feedback we always get is that, wow, we loved seeing the, the globes and meeting Paul, uh, Professor Paul, as we like to call you. And the first question I always want to know, and our audience wants to know when they come on our tours, is our, our globes here, if you can see them, these globes here, how do we look after these fantastic globes? You know, how do we care for them? Well, they're, they're fairly uh, fragile structures to, to move about, and obviously they're historic, they're old, they've uh, suffered and aged over time. Uh, so what we've done with our collection here is to, first of all, give it this primary housing, this handling uh, uh, container so that all the globes uh, have got a bespoke container that they're placed in like this where you can obviously you can easily see the globe uh, but also it can easily be handled without needing to be packed up and moved around. Uh, so it's about so reducing that, touch? Uh, yes and reducing handling because handling on any object is wear and tear uh, and, and often if things are going on display they'll need to be looked at by the curator, by the conservator, they'll need to be packaged and moved about. So uh, an object gets a lot of handling when it's the focus for something like a display or an exhibition. Um, these are all stored in uh, metal cabinets, so they're protected from the light. Uh, otherwise, we might want to put them in, a, in a, an enclosed box, but these but are all got these protected from light exposure within the cabinets, but these are then easy to handle and can readily be seen when you open the cupboards. There's special occasions like today when yes. we get them out or on our Thursday tours, which you can come and join us on. So, right, I'm one of those, when I was a kid, Paul, I always tell you this and you always look at me a bit strange. <laughs> I was that strange child who would like to find out what was inside things. So give me a saw and a golf ball, I would open it up, you know, to look into the VCR and see what's inside. I was intrigued by the workings. Now, we've got quite a few globes in our collection, um, all of different materials, but tonight is all about paper. We're focusing on paper. So how do... You, what, what's inside a paper globe? Well, the type of globes we got, the more traditional type. Well, in a sense, I'm similar to you and like to know how, how things work and what they're like inside. Um, there's something over 300 globes in, uh, in the collection altogether. About 220 of those are of the basis of uh, a hollow uh, paper-layered sphere with a plaster coating over which is a printed paper image. Could be a celestial or a, a terrestrial. Um, so basically they, you want to be able to reproduce these. The whole point of having a printing process as opposed to a manuscript process is to be able to re reproduce the item um, to sell, okay. basically, and uh, for scholarly use. So a, a, a basic kit for making a globe would be to have a former. Um, traditionally, they would either be uh, uh, a wooden turned ball, heavily varnished uh, to protect the surface, or sometimes a raised metal uh, sphere or hemisphere on which to form the, the, the paper shell. Um, then basically it would be torn paper, uh, uh, wet and uh, then pasted on, pasted together in layers and built up over the sphere, really just like that. Um, yep, you can have those. <laughs> To the point where you'd end up with, here's one I've made earlier, um, a hemisphere, and there's something like 10 layers of paper wow. has been placed on there and put together. What you do notice, though, no, no matter how careful you are at making it, it's, it's got a slightly raised, bumpy surface. It's not a perfectly spherical uh, uh, thing. But you'll show us later how yes. we solve that problem, I guess. Yeah. Now, another way that was uh, affected to, to make the process quicker, because obviously sticking lots of bits of paper on takes quite a lot of time. Uh, and, and this is a sort of, uh, in the 1750s, something like that. They've moved on to making uh, a former uh, of the gore shape. We refer to this as a gore, mm -hmm. G-O-R-E. Um, uh, dressmakers would be familiar with talking about gores because oh. you get it. Uh, and it's a land measure, I believe. So. Uh, the, there are several uses for that, that term, gore, 
And that would be made in metal, I guess? This would be made in metal as, a, as your master. And then on large sheets of card, you'd use this to, to just draw around. And rather like the uh, hours on a clock, you would move it round until you'd drawn the whole sheet out. And then you'd cut out the middle. So you've got a, a template there. Ah. And so this is what it's like when it's cut out. You've got a rather sort of petal-shaped <laughs> object that, again, you would align on your, uh, your former. These would be damped and, again, would be pasted on. And you'd have maybe five or six layers like this placed on, aligned over the joints, and slowly built up until you had made a similar sort of uh, shape as we've shown you there. Obviously, you need two to make a globe sphere. And you can see these are a bit misshapen, uh, which would be joined together. Now, there are uh, further things going on inside. And there's a couple of quick images here. These are, these are x-rays of, of globes from our, our collection. Um, one here shows a metal pivot running down the middle. And on this globe, there's a, a wooden uh, pillar running through the globe there. So, And is that, the, is that the pillar you were talking about? Yeah, in so the you would have a turned pillar, and this would be placed inside the globe, inside the shell, would be nailed on to make it firm. That would give you the supports for the pivots which are needed to mount the, the globe into its stand. And then you would join the two halves together, and this... This image quite nicely shows a band of, of fabric cloth binding the, the glued edges together. Ah. Now, that's, that's what we've got our 3D form. We've got our shape. How do we make it smooth then? Because, obviously, well, as you said, it's a bit bobbly at this stage, no matter which process we went through. Well, and also you want an accurate finish. So to, to give you a perfectly spherical finish, your paper sphere placed together would need to be put into a, a, a former like this. If you just oh, hold that, I'll just tip that forward so people can see running here, there's a metal form here that's been accurately filed down to give you a perfectly, uh, a perfect semicircle of uh, shape. So if you imagine this was the, 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 the paper globe, it would be sat into the stand there uh, there'd be a small gap around the paper. You, you make the paper ball smaller mm -hmm. than the stand. And then you put on various coatings of uh, gesso or plaster, uh, chalk whiting with uh, animal glue, and uh, made up to a creamy consistency and placed on the surface. And as you rotate the globe within, it scrapes down along that edge to give you a very accurate, smooth surface. For the, for the globe. And is this what all this excess yes, this is, is around there, this, then? This did come from a globe manufacturer. It's <laughs> a, a, a prop we uh, hold on to. Then the next part is the, the paper image. Um, and as I've got here, there's three gores from a, um, a terrestrial globe. And there's a full set there of 12 gores for a, a, a celestial so these would be cut out and, again, damped, pasted, and you'd form those onto the surface. Now, that's quite a difficult job to do because even though these are cut into shape to, to fit onto the sphere, you've still got to be able to form the paper down and manipulate it to get it to, to really join together themselves. very accurately. <laughs> so uh, that it was quite a skilled job. And just finally... to come to this. This is a rather sad example, but it's very useful to have things like this. They show us exactly how they were made. This is a pressed sphere, so we're going on to a, another form of manufacturing where the card is in gore shapes but would be put into a press and squeezed to form it into a, a, a hemisphere. And there'd be two of these. And this shows you nicely the wooden pillar, the turned wooden pillar, uh, which is nailed through the poles. There's the plaster coating, and you get an idea of how thick the plaster is over the surface there. And then finally, the printed paper gauze that are um, damped, pasted on. And finally, when it's all dry, they would be varnished to protect the surface. Wow. So that's, uh, 
It's no, uh, no easy uh, task there. <laughs> quite a, quite, a, quite a, a craft task, it yes. It really shows how our collection, you know, it's not... Yes, it tells us history, it tells us stories, but it shows us the skills of the people who made these items, you know. Um, globes today, you know, they come in many different forms. They're mass-produced and they're plastic. But this, just hearing you talk about that, is so... The techniques is amazing. Well, and this, just quickly, this process, our earliest globe in the collection is 1537, uh, and that's a, a, a paper-layered hollow sphere. Uh, and basically the process to make that was still carried through with innovations right through until uh, the middle of the 20th century, until we get to modern materials, and then you're off on a different direction then. Well, if you are a fan of globes, <laughs> like, <laughs> who isn't? If you're a fan of globes, come and um, come and visit us on Thursdays or uh, so on our Thursday tours, the first Thursday of every month. I'm just going to repeat this again. Um, if you're really interested in knowing about the process of how we care for things, but part of that, you also get to go into our stores and I will show you um, our uh, amazing globe collection. It's spoilt for choices with Mercators and so many different types of globes to a Russell. Well, they, and they go from an inch to a metre in oh, diameter. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So please come along if you're interested. Now, it's not just globes uh, we have in our paper studio at the moment of items we look after. This is a huge studio, as you've seen, Helen, already. Coming up, we have Emmanuel, who is going to tell us about what we're currently working on, um, which is going to be really exciting. But next, we're going to go to a video from one of our curatorial team, Alex, who's going to tell us about his favourite item um, made from paper in the collection. So enjoy this video, and um, we'll see you in a tick. Hello everyone, um, apologies for that, I, we're having some technical issues with the sound on that video, but what we will do, we'll put it on our PPMCC uh, webpage so you can watch it uh, later on, I do apologise for that, but in the meantime, it, very lucky we've got some other exciting things for you, but before I introduce our next special guest, um, I just want to remind you, if you have any questions, for our conservators today, 
please get them in if you want to know about um, how to look after any certain paper items or if even just want to tell us what your favorite paper-based item is something very special to you please please let me know but Emmanuel you're back yes Yay! you've got some really interesting things and I know very little about it so this is where I get really excited okay. um, so this is the moment where I ask you what what are you currently working on so if someone came into the studio what would they see so at the moment working on the various range of project we working on some rotation in the museum so because the paper object are light sensitive we are doing constantly rotation on the paper display within the museum we're looking after the collection in the store to make sure they are stored in the right environment with the right housing but on the studio at the moment i've selected two objects we are working on um, two objects that are going on loan in different places so the first object i placed here is a 19, early 19th century logbook. Uh, it's part of a manuscript collection in the, in the archive. Um, so this one will be going on display in a London museum. Uh, when it came to the studio, it was in fairly good condition. Um, only the sewing was broken, so my colleague Bethia did the so redid the sewing, but to not modify the, the, or, like the original too much, we just change a thread, reuse the same sewing station to make sure everything is secure without transforming it too much. And then to have it display safely and in a, to make it also accessible and legible for everyone, my colleague Helen that we just saw a few minutes ago made this beautiful 3D um, book support out of a conservation card. Um, Do you want to? Ah, oh, there you go, you can see it now. Yeah. So each cradle is make bespoke for each book because each book would have like different opening angle and we need support in different places. So she look at the book, measure the opening angle and make sure it's supported uh, where it's needed. Mm -hmm. Wow, the technicalities of it all where you just think, oh, it's just a book, it'll be all right. But you've got to think about the pressure and all those things. Yeah. Wow. Um, so the next item we have, I'm quite excited about, and this is because um, I'm from a fine art background and I get really excited by drawings. And this one's really, really special. And um, when we were doing our practice run earlier, someone, uh, the director told us, mention how old this is, because this is really exciting. This is, you know, it's probably around 350 years old. This is, yes. this is a very special drawing. Um, which is really exciting because um, you can actually, this is one of our own artists, I say one of our own <laughs> artists, um, originally from Holland, um, but um, the Van der Veldes, this is Van der Velde the Elder, is that The right? Younger. Oh, The Younger. Yeah, oh, yeah. ah, so it's, uh, so his father was more known for being the uh, draftsman, but The Younger, obviously you can see in this drawing, is a fantastic draftsperson themselves, and they had a studio in the Queen's house. And that's probably why we've got quite a few of their drawings. Yeah, we have 14, approximately 1,400 Van der Velde drawings. Wow. So it's a worldwide uh, recognized collection of Van der Velde drawing. So this drawing is a beautiful ink drawing um, made on handmade paper. Um, sorry, could you put this on the side? Thank you. Um, so it's um, iron galling drawing on paper. Um, and this one is in the studio at the moment because it will be going on loan in Holland in um, the autumn. Um, so you can see it's in an old, what we would call an old mount. Um, it looks really nice uh, with um, all the wash, but it's not made of conservation grade material. So potentially with time, it could cause some um, damage and discoloration to the, the object. So to prep the object for loan, we're going to remove the object from this mount, give it a conservation grade mount, and also I can show you maybe at the back. So how is it attached? So it's attached with two hinges. So it's um, with gum tape paper, but you can see the white hinges are quite stiff and they could create some tension on the drawing and the um, deformation on the edges of the drawing. So we're going to remove them and replace them with uh, conservation material. We're using um, a Japanese um, 
Japanese paper and like with we saw stuff in paper. the last video. Exactly. Oh. And also we will show the four edges of the drawing and how not hide them um, in the new month. Why is that? Because I've noticed that's become more of a trend in mounts. Is that to take the pressure off the paper? Or? So it does uh, take some pressure out of the paper, but also I think it's nice that the public can see the full object and all the edges. I think it's quite interesting to see because this is called decal edges. Mm -hmm. So it's when the paper was made, the edge of the paper, so you can see it's imperfect, but it's a trace of the... Um, manufacturing of the paper and the mold where the paper was made. So I think it's a nice information to share as well with uh, the public. Oh, that's great. You get to yeah. see, because this is a sketch, this is, you know, you really see the personalised elements, which is really nice. So, Emmanuel, thank yes. you so You're much. Very this is lovely. And if you want to see um, Emmanuel and and all this magical behind the scenes element for yourself. It's the first Thursday of every month. Um, and so come on, there's a link on the, on the website where you can book. So we'd love to come a lot to see you and just join us because we love this. We absolutely love what we do and we want to share it with you because it is so magical. So I'm going to invite Paul to come and join us again. So Emmanuel, if you come on this side and then excellent Paul over here. Now, if you've got any questions, this is your last chance. Give us a put some into into the box, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see if our guys can help out and answer them. <laughs> but the first question we've got is for Paul. It's for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Paul, we someone wants to know what is our biggest globe. Uh, the biggest rigid globe, which is of uh, similar form to this, although when they get to that size, they have a very uh, stout wooden structure before the plaster goes on rather than a, mm. a card shell. But the largest uh, diameter globe in our collection is a, a Coronelli globe, um, which is 108 centimetres in diameter. Wow. And that's currently on display in the Pacific Gallery in the main museum, oh. so that can be seen. And that's, it's, uh, it went into that gallery a little while ago, but previous to that had been in store for something like 30 or 40 years without being seen. It was in this so. room for a while as well. It, yes, it, it, it needed a, a fair bit of tender care. I, I remember when I first started, you were working on that very lovingly. And yes. as you say, please go to see the Pacific Gallery at um, the National Maritime Museum. It is free entry as well, and it is a beautiful globe in a fantastic exhibition. Um, so, uh -huh. I've got a question for you as yeah. well. Okay. So... How did you get into conservation, especially paper? But, you know, it, people want to know, how do you get into something like this? Because, mm -hmm. you know, how do you look after, you know, how do you go, oh, I want to look after paper? Um, I think I always liked paper as a material, but when I stud was studying, I was also taking some drawing classes. Uh, but I w and I studied science and then art history, and for me, it was a great way to combine both and also I always like doing manual things and craft and I thought for me conservation is a great combination of science, a bit of history, like knowing about things are made and also manual uh, dexterities, all of things I like combining wine so I thought conservation was uh, a good option for me. It's, it's brilliant. It's, it's really interesting just seeing all this magic come, you know, like you just seeing how you look after something so simple, but to keep, like we've got a piece of paper which is 350 years old, it's amazing. If you want to see this, definitely come and join us. It's not just um, on the first Thursday of every month. We also have some other exciting opportunities coming up. Um, in August, every Saturday, I'm going to do my Saturday Superstore tour, um, which is family friendly, so family friendly, um, children can come for free. I would advise, over eight years old, um, ideally. But on that, you will get to see some fantastic items in our store from items which have been on the Titanic and other amazing narratives. So definitely come and join us for that. And um, until then, stay tuned. Keep putting your questions into the uh, chat box. We'll be in touch with you. And also keep an eye out for Alex's video on our website. And um, 
Till next time, thank you very much to yourselves for watching, but also thank you for Paul and Emmanuel for joining me. Thank you, Matt. Me. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Till next time, good night. <laughs>